Good morning, everyone. I'm Maria Carreras Corpenos, treasurer of the Alumni Association of Princeton University and a member of the great class of 1985. This is a day that typically would have brought alumni to campus to sample Princeton's intellectual offerings and highlight the achievements of alumni. But this year, more than any other, Princeton is where you are. And today's Forward Fest, while different from Alumni Day, is an opportunity to do those things virtually. We want to hear from you throughout a year of forward thinking and particularly during Forward Fest. Be sure to tag any of your forward thinking posts on social media with hashtag Princeton Forward. Okay, that thanks. includes any questions and comments you want to share with the Princetonians who will be speakers on the broadcast. Our focus in today's two sessions is on alumni forward thinkers. This first session highlights resilience. I'm delighted to introduce to you the moderator of our conversation, Heather Gerken, Princeton class of 1991. In addition to her role as university trustee at Princeton, Heather is also Dean and the Saul and Lillian Golden Professor of Law at Yale Law School. Take it away, Heather. Thank you, Maria, and welcome to Princeton University's Forward Fest and today's session, Thinking Forward Resilience. My name is Heather Gerken of the great class of 1991, and I'm delighted to be with you today. I'm looking forward to diving into the idea of resilience, and I'm thrilled to be joined by three Princeton alumni who are forward thinkers in this area. With us today are Josh Brankman, Executive Director of Outward Bound USA and member of the Princeton class of 1999, Elizabeth R. Henry, pediatrician and parent coach, and a member of the Princeton class of 1990, 1988, known affectionately as Dr. Liz, and Suleika Jawad, journalist, author, and advocate, and a member of the class of, of 2010. So we'll start by welcoming Josh Brankman to the discussion. Josh, it's so nice to have you here. Thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure, good morning, nice to see you. It's nice to see you. So uh, I wanted to start a little bit, but maybe if you could just t tell the audience a little bit about the work you do. You've been in both the classroom space and Outward Bound, and just, just sort of give us a sense of, 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 of the work that you do that's going to bring us to this conversation. Uh, great. Thanks, Heather. Um, so my, my career path uh, following graduation from Princeton really went right into the classroom. Um, so I was a member of the class of 1999 and was a uh, participant in the teacher preparation program at Princeton. Uh, and following that, uh, instead of moving into a traditional classroom, I actually found myself working in al an alternative uh, residential program in Colorado. And that really began about a 10 year career in public education, working with young people and educators and their fam and families from around the country, um, but most specifically here in California, where I still live. Uh, and I think what I discovered in that work was that in working with young people and their families, especially, um, certainly public education, the role of public education is about delivering academic skills that we all know and sort of think about when we think about school. Um, but what I quickly found, and I think educators uh, all find when you enter the classroom and spend some time there, that there's another half of that educational experience. Uh, and, and that is that sort of social emotional learning that we all either do without thinking about or really as a directed effort to develop the skills we need to be successful moving forward and to pursue our dreams and, 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 and live the lives we want to. Uh, and that was the first place where I discovered uh, social emotional learning and through that, this idea of developing resilience in young people and how do you support young people in their own development of resilience. Uh, and following my work in public education, I moved into the nonprofit space and with Outward Bound, where the same notions applied, but where Outward Bound was using those skills um, and, and that notion of resilience and leadership and character uh, with young people in natural settings and finding ways to really pull and support 
um, those notions of developing resilience in young people through uh, challenging outdoor experiences. And that's where I find my work today. And um, I just think, you know, this year especially, but certainly every year uh, as I continue that work, we discover that the development of resilience and the honing of resilience um, really is just becoming one of those key topics where um, young people who are able to do that are, are finding more passion, more joy, more purpose in, in their lives. And, and so that's the work that I'm committed to doing. It's really inspiring work. And I wonder if you might just tell us what you think the word resilience means. I mean, I think people use it all the time, but I don't think know if we have a clear definition of it. Yeah, I, I think it, it does depend. And certainly, you know, if, if you go online, you can, you can read all about different versions of how people think about resilience. I think the words that stick for me are this notion of elasticity and sort of this development of um, being able to bounce back and sort of move forward from learned experiences. And so, you know, in the outward bound context or in the classroom context, the way I think about that is, how do you over time progressively experience opportunities that perhaps put you in a learning zone? Um, so in outward bound, we talk about type two fun. So type two fun is not always fun at the moment, it's fun sort of after the fact or during reflection, but how do you experience something that then upon reflection, uh, you are able to learn from that experience and really sort of fill your well of experiences that allow you to bounce back more quickly, bounce back um, more effectively, or maybe um, have this sort of toolkit um, in, your, in, in your possession that allows you to navigate what life throws at you. Um, and so that's how I think about resilience and how I think we think about resilience at Outward Bound. Um, and I will particularly note that there's there's this notion of individual resilience. I think we all have the ability to hone and develop that skill. But I also think there's a notion of communal resilience. So how do you, whether you're an outward bound group or a classroom of students and the teacher or in your own community, how are you developing communal resilience that allows you to bounce back together with those people around you that make up you know, your, your life community? So, so let's break like that, that down. Let's start with an individual resilience and then move to communal resilience. So I know you think that people have resilience within them. This is just something they need to hone and practice and build. And so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit, just bring us into the process that you think we need to, to, to do that. Sure. I, I think that sometimes resilience is spoken to like a thing that can be transferred to another person. So you either someone doesn't have resilience or they are not resilient and therefore they need to be made resilient. Um, I think about it somewhat differently, which is I think we all have just by being you know, human and having lived life experiences, we all have developed some level of resilience and it's different and varied based on our own life experiences. But I think what the way Outward Bound imagines resilience is how do we draw from that? How do we pull from one's lived experience to continue to further you know, that, that ability to bounce back? Um, so in, in our work, the way we think about it is developing a progression of challenges over time that you are able to engage in, struggle through, not always be successful. So you, sometimes you're successful, sometimes you may actually fail and failure is good in this way sometimes and reflect upon that and then start that cycle again. So we do think about it as a sort of turning of the wheel, but you need to have all of those opportunities. So you can't just have a whole number of tough experiences and not have the space to reflect on it. So it's very deliberate to have this progression of experience, experience that opportunity, think about it, learn about it, talk about it, and then move on to another experience. And so that's the way, certainly at Outward Bound, we think about that for the individual. Um, and, and if we all reflect on our own lives, I, I think we can all probably write down ways in which we have all developed resilience in that way. You've had this learning experience and then the next time you're confronted with a similar situation, you have that toolkit that you can move on from. So I actually was lucky enough once to do Outward Bound and when you just described it, it was exactly, I mean, I, at that point I was in, uh, in college and I had no idea that that was what you were structuring, but I now see it really precisely. Can we talk a little bit about the type two experience the fun. So I, um, I just wonder if this, I, I remember um, diving into an icy river to swim uh, and then hiking up Mount Albert. Um, so, so I think those might qualify for type two experiences. Can you just say a little bit more? I know you think people should be made uncomfortable. And I wonder if that's sort of what you're thinking about. 
I, yes, that is what we're thinking about. And I, it, and I should just quickly say, I mean, discomfort on its own isn't a learning experience. Discomfort is just discomfort and frankly may actually be detrimental, right? But the way we structure it at Outward Bound and I think the way we think about developing resilience is just what you described that um, their type two fun is perhaps not fun in the moment or necessarily easy in the moment, but is something that you can learn from and draw from. from. Um, and so that icy plunge that you just spoke to, in the moment, you probably weren't feeling, oh, this is really exciting and fun. I mean, some students do, but, but I think most students sort of approach that with a little bit of trepidation, a little bit of nervousness about what that might be like. And then after that experience, and especially, and maybe this is the way we jump to communal resilience, is that, and you've had that experience now with other people. So not just you, but your crewmates experience the same thing. And now you're talking about it. And all of a sudden you find yourself laughing about it and sort of patting each other on the back and talking about how interesting that was or how amazing that was. And that is the type two fun. And that in itself is this development of communal resilience. Um, that's so important. And, and I completely see, so the, I remember after you had us hike up Mount Albert, um, we, we were stranded on a, in, a, in a tent just by ourselves to think about the world. And that was the moment of reflection. How do you build in communal reflection? I mean, that seems to me the biggest challenge for the work you do. It, it is. And I think it's, something, it's a skill set that I think um, is less commonly developed in, in sort of external places, although I, thankfully I think it's becoming more common. So the, the communal resilience is this idea that not only is the individual experiencing something that, yes, hopefully they can learn from through either challenge or, or failure or success, but that that does happen with a group. So in Outward Bound, we think about crew. We say we are crew, not passengers. And so that what that means is you are together experiencing th something. And so whether it's charting a path on you know, your, your mountaineering course or whether it's navigating um, a series of rapids on a river or even just you know, talking with your crewmates about how you're gonna set up your tent, those, those experiences always aren't in the moment um, smooth sailing. Um, to, to use a metaphor, right? That they are, you have to discuss, you have challenge, different people disagree about, about what you're going to cook, where you're going to set up camp. Those experiences then on the reflection piece, it's not just, gosh, that was, we went through a bunch of rapids. It's let's talk about how you all spoke to one another and communicated with one another during that, during that challenging experience. And that piece, when you sort of call out that interpersonal um, uh, experience amongst the crewmates, is where that development of communal resilience happens. And all of a sudden people realize, oh, I think I actually performed better or felt more successful or more supported when you did this. Ah, you know, I now know that if I can extend compassion to someone else in a particular way, I may get more out of them or they may experience this in a, in a brighter or better way. That's the communal resilience that we think is so important, certainly on an outward bound course, but also in that trans, um, that transition back to sort of home life where you can do that with your family or your boss or your, your classmates or whoever your home life is. So can I just ask you that, that that's, that's the last question. How do you bring that home? I mean, it's one thing to be out on a mountain in the beauty of Colorado, but I wonder just inside the sort of a quarantine house, how do you bring those skills back into, into your own life? Yeah, I think, I think most importantly for us, it's in that reflection process. So yes, you're talk, you may be talking about that wilderness experience or that experience in the outdoors, you know, the, the, the hitting the peak and, and getting to the top of the mountain. But a, a strong outward bound instructor in, upon that reflection will actually ask the group, okay, let's talk about what are some comparisons back home? You know, have you had communication challenges with your boss, with your family, with your teacher? What, what might you do differently now that you've had this experience? What worked on course, you know, during those rapids? And how could you take that skill back to, you know, a more regular, more normal um, life experience? And so we, we actually are very intentional about asking and framing that question with young people to figure out the transference from, you know, on the trail with the map to at home when you're parent is frustrated with you because you didn't, you know, complete your chores or, or do your homework. Um, so, so that's how we imagine the transference is really to be intentional about calling it out. And there are connections to be made. I really appreciate it. I mean, I know just personally how much of an effect this program has just on individuals and it's really generous of you to come and share those lessons with all of us. So I, I very much appreciate you being here. I'm looking forward to our, our group conversation. So next we're going to talk with Dr. Liz Henry, but first, Let's just take a look at how Princeton's unbelievably innovative dance faculty, 
facing the impossible barriers of social distancing created new ways of working to inspire their own students to be creative last semester. And we'll be right back. When I rehearse for class, I am in my basement. I'm working for my, my loft here in downtown Las Vegas. I have a little, you know, eight feet square. I just use my living room. I moved everything out. I was like, I need space to dance. Every fall, the Program in Dance produces Princeton Dance Festival. It's our premier event, and it usually happens on the Berlin stage. This year, because of the restrictions brought on by the pandemic, we had to scrap all that and just trust our amazing artists on our faculty to get creative and reimagine what might be. I had a plan and I had my set and everything and I had this huge thing I wanted to make. I was overexcited because I knew exactly what I was going to make. And then, boom, everything changed and it's online, so there's no way I could do that, that plan. I had to completely re design the whole idea of what it means to do dancing in this time since we aren't able to be in the same room with each other and so much of dance and so much of this work in particular involves a transmission of like bodily knowledge. We are basically inviting people um, into the spaces of these artists' homes. It's thought-provoking, it's curious, it's playful. There are ways to create really exciting imagery from the most simple blank wall or um, a lamp in your living room. There's, there's so much that you can do if you just pay attention. When we create art, these moments are actually moments that are rich for artists to create. And I thought, well, let's create a little time capsule so that the dancers remember this moment. Merce Cunningham has this long and rich history of collaboration with visual artists, and I really wanted to bring an aspect of that into this project. Some of it is these animation experiments done by Tim's students, and some are the film and video experiments done by my students. A major focus of, of my class is the study of motion. So I think this project gave students an opportunity to, to really look closely and and kind of get inspired by the movement of um, Silas's students. I love creating duets and I love the touch, I love the contact, and we can't even hug anybody today. So I'll create different duets. There won't be touches, but there will be a, a connection. I guess I didn't really expect to feel lonely um, during this, this time or this process. I sense that the dancers are struggling now with being distanced and working on Zoom. Something I think is different with being alone, like in a pandemic, in a creative process. There's so much we could be exploring together in person that we just can't through this limitation of Zoom. When you're in a process, doing a long project from your home, it can it can sometimes feel like somewhat of a chore if you don't go about it the right way. As mentors and creators and educators, we are, you know, very sensitive in trying to take care of them now. I really wanted it to be a kind of refuge from many things. I start with a, a check-in. Uh, the check-in is extremely important. Wonderful. So we, we are back now with Dr. Liz yeah. Henry, a pediatrician who specializes in communication between tweens and teens and their parents. So welcome, Dr. Liz. It's so nice to have you here. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I I'm excited to be here. I have a lot to share with everyone. Well, I have to say, as a parent of two teenagers, I am probably one of the most people that's eager in this audience to hear from you. <laughs> Maybe you could talk a little bit about your path from Princeton and what you're doing now, and then, and then we'll uh, talk about what your views are on these questions. Yeah. Years of, of practicing pediatrics, I, I found that I had a window into the world of parents and teens. I, I got a firsthand uh, I first had, I was a first hand witness to seeing their interactions and seeing how they interacted. And times have changed. Things have dramatically changed. Things have gotten a lot more complex from 
the the social media that you see the teens using. They have to deal with being worried about school shootings, the threat of climate change. And now with this pandemic and being this remote learning and being away from their friends. So teens have a lot on their plate. And even before all of this was happening, parents were coming to me with not only medical problems, but a lot of their problems were, were based on resilience. Like how can I communicate with my teens? I'm worried about peer pressure. How can I have them uh, go through these challenges and overcome these challenges? And I realized that there was a need that needed to be filled. And so what I started to do is really develop workshops and, and, and create webinars and coach parents on on how to connect with their teens. So I developed a transformational template where I bridge uh, the generational gap between parents and teens so that they can communicate and connect with each other uh, with understanding and compassion. Uh, so that's what I did because I found in the 15 minutes of time that I had in the practice, there was no way for me to do that. Mm -hmm. So I left the practice and developed my consulting company, Dr. Liz Consulting, where that's what I do full time. So I want to get to, to the, the tools that you provide for parents and kids. Let's just start with the question, how do you define resilience, especially given the groups that you're working with? Yeah. Well, resilience to me is a multidimensional approach. And uh, like Josh was saying, uh, every human being has the capability of being resilient, but the key is knowing that you have it. And the key is to accessing it. That's, that's the key. So uh, resilience is knowing that you have a voice and being able to stick to your convictions and stand strong and know that you can do anything no matter what. So resilience for me is also re the reframing. It takes a reframing of the mind and looking at things from another lens. So when you're able to look at things from another lens, you can see an obstacle now as an opportunity and a detour now as a new destination. And I can give an example from my life. I, I, when I took a detour after, after Princeton, and I was a, a first year med school, uh, med, uh, med student. And um, all of a sudden in the middle of med school, I got burnt out. I was completely exhausted. And I questioned whether or not I wanted to pursue my, my medical degree. Mm -hmm. So after uh, I made an excruciatingly hard decision to take a leave of absence, because for me, that was like failure. What are people going to say? Like the whole, I went through the whole nine yards because I didn't know that was a detour and I had no idea where that would take me. And so with the encouragement of my mother, who I was very close to and was responsible for filling that well Josh was talking about by reminding me of my strengths, with that, I left uh, and took that leave of absence and uh, explored. And when I explored and took the time to take a breath, I realized that medicine was what I wanted to do. And I came back better than ever and went on to Georgetown, became a partner in a practice. And I achieved things that I never knew I could achieve. And because of that detour, that detour allowed me to actually get to know myself in, in a different way, know who I am. And uh, it turned that uh, obstacle into new opportunities and new possibilities for me. So can we talk a little bit about that generational gap? Because I often hear conversations about resilience from young people and older people, and they're very different. Yes. From, I, I'm, in, I, I, I'm in teaching, so I, I have some, you know, I hear those conversations play out very differently. And I know you spend time with teenagers and parents talking about shared problems. I wonder if you could just talk to us about what you think that generational gap is. Well, I think parents and teens, it's a whole different world. I mean, it's their parents and teens talk different languages. And for me, it's, it's creating what I like, how I like to see it is creating a, a triad, a, a triangle. Parents are at one corner, 
teens are at the other, of, and it's at the, the base of the triangle, and they're so far apart. They're, they're talking different languages. I mean, they're, they're, they're on different wavelengths. And so my goal is to get them towards the apex and to have them be able to communicate and understand each other. And uh, so what I do, how do I do that is, is listening. Uh, I teach them how to listen and I teach parents how to listen to teens because what happens is you, you probably have heard that your teen may say, oh, you don't listen to me, you never listen to me. And that's a common complaint of teens. But parents listen, but they listen from the filter of, of what they, how they see their teen. So, so for, for parents, no one's taught how to listen unless you're a communicator. And so we listen from the filter of what we want to hear. And so when a, when a, pa when a teen talks to their, their parent, when, when a teen talks to them, their parent is listening from, well, what can I say? say next, what am I going to tell them to do? They're really not listening to what they're saying. They're listening, they're judging and assessing, and they're waiting for an opportunity to talk. So when teens say parents aren't listening, a lot of times they're right. Parents aren't hearing what they're saying, and they're, they're not hearing their perspective. Now, they don't have to agree, but teens need to see, feel validated. So Gen Z, Gen Z has gone through a lot. I mean, as I said before, they've gone through a lot more than their parents have gone through. And, and so they're at a point where they've dealt with uh, the, and they've dealt with a lot of anxiety from school shootings and the, the threat of bombings and all of that, they've has created uh, a feeling of, of terror and unease. So um, parents, need to understand that and and get on the same page and as well as teens. Have you seen those conversations change uh, during the pandemic? I mean, I, I feel, I, you know, what you just described, I think really captures some of the generational gap. I, I will say that, that at this moment, I, I feel like par every parent's heart breaks for their child. We all know that some kids are are in completely better or worse situations, but, but, but all these kids are losing a year in the middle of their most important parts of their lives. I wonder, has that changed the conversations as you've gone forward? Well, as uh, it's changed the conversation because uh, the teens need permission to feel. And I think it's important to give them space and grace. And they, they've gone through so much that COVID has, has given the parents and teens an opportunity to have their relationships evolve. And teens are at home. They're, they're away from their friends, they're away from their activities. So this is an opportunity for parents to really connect with their teens, to sit and listen, to, to get to know them as, as people. And it's an opportunity for teens to get to know, to know their parents as well. Uh, I, that's why during this pandemic, one of the things I created is a, an email challenge course where, where parents get emails on a daily basis with little, less, with little lessons and, and assignments because it helps them uh, really connect and get close to the teens. So I think this is an obstacle that, can be turn, that should be turned into an opportunity. So I just love that idea. It, it reminds me when I, um, I once injured myself when I went back to rehab and they said, with great surprise, well, you've improved. And I said, well, every day I did the things that you told me to do. They said, nobody does that. They just come in and <laughs> do rehab when they're with us. <laughs> so, and I imagine you must feel the same way that, that there's a, when you said those, those increments that you were having in person weren't enough. Um, so, so you built out this program. Is this, is this a 21 day program or is it a lifetime program? How do you well, think it's about a 21 it? is called boost your connection with your teen. And it's a 21 day program where parents get emails, uh, daily emails for 21 days. So uh, that's, that helps. And I find the accountability helps, you know, you're getting a lesson, you do it, and then you're held accountable for it. And I think that's important because I take a preventive approach because it's, it's important to, to, remind teens, for parents to remind teens of their strengths, to create 
that reservoir so that before an obstacle happens, teens can draw on the strengths. They know what their strengths are. They know what their talents are, and they can use them not only to overcome that obstacle, but to surpass it and, and, and go into greatness. So uh, that's my approach uh, to, to connecting parents and teens and to transforming it. Because these times the, the, the CDC has said that the suicide rate among teens between, or young youth between the ages of 10 to 24 has increased 50, over 57% between 2007 and 2018. Oh. And, and that, that's just incredible. Uh, and, and so you have to get, we, we can't, as, as our generation, talk about generational gap, we can't measure Gen Z by our measuring stick. And that's what we tend to do. Well, back in the day, this is, what, this is how we managed it. But the world is totally different. We can't compare it. I, I think that is so powerful because I often I often hear older gen. What about resilience? What about resilience? It's, what do you think this group of students has gone through in just in the last year? Right. I think we have to suspend the older generation saying right. that the younger generation isn't resilient. It's I mean, just, it's, working it's, totally, it's totally different. The social media. I mean, we didn't have the social media. We didn't have the technology. We didn't have to be on. Uh, all the time. We weren't worried about likes and comments uh, and, and cyber bullying didn't exist. Now they can be bullied in the, conf in the comfort of their own home through a computer screen. And it's all invisible also to parents. Some, all of that stuff is very hard for them to see when yes. they're coming forward. Yeah. So it's, my it's job is to have parents see that and also to, to uh, develop teens so that they can see their strengths. And then, so working on both sides, my goal is to connect them, have them go to the, they're gonna be conflicts. They're, of course, they're gonna be conflicts. The relationships aren't gonna be perfect, but my goal is not to have them stuck apart in their conflicts and allow them and empower them to be able to resolve their conflicts and move back towards the apex. So they're not distant permanently. Can I ask you the same kind of question I asked Josh, which is just about bringing it home? Because I imagine that this is a very hard job, that you're, you're bearing a burden of pain with other people and you have to be distance enough from it so that you can help, but close enough to it so you can empathize. And that's just, that must be exhausting. And I wonder how you sort of think about that, especially as I, I imagine your experience, the pandemic as, as everyone else, and that you've got a lot of things going on in your own life. So I wonder, how are you connecting these two parts of your life? Well, uh, I, I connect because I have to draw on my own. I, I have to draw on my own resilience during those times. And uh, I, I use my my mother, uh, who is, is no longer with me, but I, her inner voice is is in my head and, and what she instilled in me to do and be the best that I could be. So, um, you know, I, I draw on the resilience that I've gotten along the way. Your mom must have been a remarkable woman to have that kind of great voice in, in, in your head. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Liz. I'm looking forward to pulling you back into the bigger conversation. Um, so next we're gonna be speaking with Suleika Jawad, but first let's hear a little bit more from our creative dance faculty and our students about what they learn from approaching their craft in a new way. I'll start with a, a check-in. Uh, the check-in is extremely important to us. So we have a check-in and then we uh, uh, talk about our day and what is happening to us and we always focus in what is the good news of the day. During these times I have been finding working on Zoom that it's important to establish a sense of community even though it is virtual. The rehearsal process can in many ways feel like you're dancing with other people. Um, we start each class with a very um, communal Qigong practice, which Peter does an excellent job of really making it feel like we're all in the space together. We would always do this little improvisation towards the camera. And just doing that together and warming up together just made us feel like we were actually touching each other in an actual dance studio. You know, for a lot of their classes, they're sitting in the chair in front of the computer. So we get up, we move our furniture around, we dance in the class. They started becoming musicians because they needed to respect the, if this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, one, two, three. Even if this person is a two and this person is four, you know that counts as there. For me, 
there's a beautiful side to having the time and to work with a professional filmmaker and learn another craft. Um, so I've also been just very excited about that process and seeing the dancers kind of develop that skill for themselves. What I've been kind of doing is putting my phone on the tripod and then like using this little clicker to start have it start recording and then kind of dance around this space, have to check on it, see if everything was in the frame. There are some shots that are in my kitchen, on my couch, in my bedroom, yeah. That's what's been inspiring as an educator, especially to see that we are really um, forever evolving and learning and expanding. This has offered us a platform to think outside of our boxes and create virtual experiences to get larger audiences globally. I mean, the arts organizations are visionaries. We don't create problems, we create solutions. And I find that quite inspiring. The Lewis Center was tremendous in the support of this work from the very beginning of my conversation because they basically were like, tell us what you need to make this vision happen. It seemed like the dance department was trying their best to, you know, offer this new experience for us that would still be meaningful in the virtual space. And I think that gave me like some hope for the semester. It also shows like how much they care about us, even if we are so far away. I think right now everyone is craving community because we're so distant. And I have found most of my interactions online have been so deep. These conversations that we're having now are really just human beings coming together looking for answers and for solace and for support and for humanity. I do miss the stage. I miss the stage so much, but this is just a time to, to kind of connect our roots and connect our community and just love one another. I pushed myself into the moment. I adapted myself. And now I see that there's a possibility to do some great things. We still miss that in-person uh, uh, sweating and, and, and happiness and the energy, the personal energy. But if we have to do it again, I won't say no, we can do it. glad to welcome journalist, author, and advocate Suleika Jawad to the conversation. So welcome, Suleika. It's nice Thank to have you here. Me. I'm so thrilled to be here. So I have to say, I was so inspired by your story. It is really just a remarkable journey. I, I wonder if maybe you can start us uh, when you were at Princeton mm -hmm. and you were sort of looking forward to a, a future thrilling career, and then all of a sudden everything came to a stop. Uh, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, about the, that moment in your life. So I graduated from Princeton in 2010 um, and I had these aspirations of becoming a journalist, a foreign correspondent, uh, but because um, this was shortly after the great recession, um, life did not go as planned on a number of levels. Uh, I found myself working as a paralegal at a law firm in Paris and trying to figure out my next steps. Uh, but bef before I was able to really do that, I received a diagnosis of leukemia uh, when I was 22. Uh, and it was one of those bifurcating moments where you have a very clear sense of, you know, your life before and your life after. Um, and so, you know, in to compress a, a very long story into a short one, I would end up spending the next uh, almost four years in treatment, uh, largely in isolation in hospital rooms and in my childhood bedroom. Um, but during that time, uh, I started to think about how I might engage with my illness creatively. Illness was omnipresent and um, I realized that I could also make it my subject. Uh, and so I started writing uh, my New York Times column, Life Interrupted, from my hospital room and found myself reporting from the front lines of a very different kind of conflict zone than the one I'd imagined. Um, but that, you know, set me on a path, uh, not just of trying to understand 
resilience in the context of what I was experiencing, but also, you know, observing it and, and studying it um, among, you know, the patients that I met, the stories I, I later went on to report. And it's really, you know, been one of uh, the topics that I found endlessly complex and, and fascinating. So, so like, how did you, I, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you managed to write about something in the middle of it. It's, um, it's in some ways the same kind of question I just asked Dr. Liz, but, but there's a way in which you have to have some distance to write about it and yet you're living it and it's, and it's the, the most overwhelming thing imaginable. I mean, how did you, how did you strike that balance in, mm -hmm. in your writing? So in creative writing classes, students are often told, you know, whether they're writing uh, first person in, in the first person or they're writing fiction to write uh, not from their wounds, but from their scars, um, because that, that measure of distance can be so helpful. Uh, but the reason I decided to report on that experience um, in real time from the trenches is that a lot of the illness narratives I read were written from the perspective of survivors who were many years out of their illness. And it's such a different perspective. Um, whereas for me, you know, at the time I'd been given about a 35% chance of survival and um, to experience illness from that vantage point is very different. It's a different experience when you don't know how your story is going to end or when likely it's not going to end um, in, in the way that you'd hoped. And I wanted to capture that, that sense of unknown, um, the uncertainty when you know the specter of mortality is kind of haunting the edges of the room. I also knew that there was a way in which um, I wouldn't have the same clarity if and when I emerged from the experience. Um, and, and, and that clarity is such a, a particular thing, I think, that's, that, that comes when you find yourself uh, confronting mortality straight on. There's a way in which all the artifice falls away. Um, and, and for me, at least, I felt a kind of laser focus uh, perhaps, you know, for the first time in my life about what was important to me, what it was that I wanted to do with like the three hours I was well enough to, to have energy to do anything um, each day, who I wanted to spend that time with. Um, and I think especially, you know, for recent college graduates, um, especially, you know, coming out of a school like Princeton, where you've worked so hard to prepare for a life and, you know, you're told to pursue your passion. And I think it's easy at that age to set yourself on a path without allowing yourself the room to be curious and to explore and maybe to pursue certain paths that aren't as practical or that don't make as much sense. Um, so for me, I found myself strangely in this kind of liberated space where the stakes were very low in terms of what I did, you know, beyond my treatment. And there were, there was very little expectation um, and that was uh, so creatively freeing and um, allowed me to play and to experiment and to tap into a different kind of voice. I was, I was thinking of the connection between some of the things that Josh said and, and, and your story, because I know you have a similar view. You, you think that resilience is a muscle or that you, mm -hmm. that you have inside, but you have to exercise and yours must be the most powerful, strong <laughs> muscle also. But Josh also talked about reflection and mm -hmm. I wonder now, do you go back and read those columns now that you're one of the people who could have written that second kind of book? Uh, yeah. do, do you go back and read those columns and, and think about them? I'm, I'm just curious at how you look back to that moment. now. Yeah, I'm so glad I have those columns. They're almost like an archive of that experience. Um, but you know, I, I do think of, of resilience as a muscle, but it's also an inheritance. We are you know, enormously resourceful, creative, resilient beings, both as, as individuals and as a species. And we're uh, the direct genetic descendants of ancestors who have survived unthinkable hardships and, and survival is kind of our shared historical story. So I think, you know, resilience is something that we all have encoded within us, but um, it's often not until um, you're faced with 
you know, a, a trial or a great hardship, like say an illness that you have to necessarily um, practice that resilience and enact it. Um, and, you know, I think of resilience as a kind of psychological hardiness um, and, um, you know, during the time that I was in treatment, I had this, this uh, quote from, from Viktor Frankl, uh, the great Viktor Frankl that I jotted onto um, the back page of my journal. And um, he said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. Um, and I would just add a beat to that, uh, which is that it allows us, um, and our response allows us, you know, the ability to, to practice that muscle of resilience. Um, and it was something I thought about a lot because I don't think that, you know, just say, you know, being very ill makes you resilient. Uh, there are many ways we can choose to respond to something, uh, to, to respond to something like a diagnosis. Um, and there are ways in which we can fold in our in on ourselves. And then there are ways in which we can choose a different kind of response. We can choose to look at, at that trial or, or that hardship as uh, something that can teach us and shape us and maybe even improve us. Um, and so that was, you know, at very much um, at, at the, you know, very much felt like it was at the heart of, of what I could control uh, within that time of illness at a time when I had very little control and had to seed so much of it. Um, and something, yeah, that I thought about a lot. So like, I want to ask you about your book, but, but I want to just first talk about uh, a project that you've done during COVID, just, just all the things that you said about isolation. And I realize there is no connection <laughs> that's uh, between COVID and isolation and, and what was mm -hmm. happening to you. On the other hand, the idea of life being interrupted and taking a pause. And, 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 and so I know you created this project called Isolation Journals. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you just might say a little bit more about it, because it just resonated with me about what you said about learning and reflecting and finding new ways to respond to something. Yeah, so, you know, um, almost a year ago now, as everything went, everyone went into lockdown, um, I found myself um, having this kind of strange response of, oh, I know this, this is familiar, the face mask, the isolation, you know, the hypervigilance, uh, the sense of uncertainty, all of that while, you know, unfolding in a very different context was something that I had lived. Um, and I think, you know, for me, part of how I've exercise that muscle of creativity has been through expression and through creativity um, and specifically uh, through journaling, which is a very different kind of practice than like the capital W writing I do in my work. Um, and it was something that uh, had been, you know, very helpful to me while I was sick and I wanted to extend that uh, to a bigger community. So the premise of the isolation journals is really simple. Um, we send out free uh, weekly prompts from different artists, or artists and thinkers and community leaders and um, individuals. Um, and, you know, so on the one hand, there's, the, there's this invitation to reflect and, um, to do so in the privacy of the journal. But the second piece of the isolation journals that was really important to me was to give um, our community members the opportunity to share their journal entries, because I think there's something really powerful that happens uh, not only when we kind of dare to, to express ourselves vulnerably and, and to write uh, in a way that kind of reveals certain unvarnished truths, but when we share uh, those expressions, um, there's a reverberation that happens. And it's, I think, a way um, for us to convert isolation into a kind of creative solitude and, and connection. Um, and, um, you know, we, earlier uh, you talked about individual versus communal resilience, um, but that community 
piece uh, to me, both, you know, in my own life, but, you know, um, in, in, in the lives of other people that I've observed is so crucial, I think, to our ability um, to, to strengthen our resilience. Um, and I think there are a couple of, of different thoughts that have come to mind as I've reflected on, on this pandemic and how, you know, I've endured it and different people I know have endured it. And also, um, on the parallels to the kind of community that I had to build when I was sick. Um, but I think, um, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is how, in a way, um, I think the people I know who are most resilient build a community um, before they need it. Um, and they root their participation in that community in uh, like initial acts of generosity so that you're like giving yourself before you expect anything from anybody. Um, and I think there are so many interesting ways of, of building community, especially in this age of social media or, or Zoom, um, which I think has allowed us, um, you know, to connect even if we're siloed in our respective homes, but it's also um, allowed the possibility of um, people who, you know, might otherwise be living with certain limitations, like an illness, say, who couldn't travel before the pandemic to participate in forms like this, to be in conversation, um, which I think is, is one, you know, of, of the silver linings uh, of this experience. We've all had to, yeah, exercise that, that muscle of resilience, but more than that, we've had to exercise uh, the muscle of, of creativity and reimagining how we gather. So I'm, I definitely want to bring that back to our group when we get started. I wonder before, just for our last a moment, just with, with the two of us, if you might just say a, a, a short description of the book that you're, that you're about to have um, out on the, on the market. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the book is about that experience of illness, but more than that, it's about aftermaths um, and what happens when we survive something that was thought to be unsurvivable. And so for me, what that ended up looking like was a kind of ritual of re-entry of my own making when I emerged from treatment. Um, and I learned how to drive and ended up embarking on a 15,000 mile road trip to visit some of the different strangers who'd been writing me letters uh, during the time that I was sick. And I ended up visiting over 22 different people um, from all kinds of backgrounds. I visited a family of survivalist ranchers in Montana. I visited a teenage girl in Florida who was also emerging from cancer treatment. And I visited a man on death row in Texas who'd never been sick, but who related to that experience of, of profound isolation and confinement and also the, the ways in which, uh, yeah, survival becomes its own kind of creative act. Thank you so much. So, so uh, I know we're gonna come back together to talk and I just wanna say, please, uh, those of you in the audience, stay where you are because after this break, we're gonna bring all of today's forward thinkers back to have a, a joint discussion. But first, just one more treat for all of you. Um, just as our dancers needed to pivot to new ways of performing, our lab engineers needed to take stock and find a new path forward for their extraordinarily important research. So we're about to hear an example of resilience in action in Princeton's Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. We were confronted with the problem of being remote. And so the question is, how could we run the laboratory? I'm an experimentalist, and I believe that it's absolutely critical that students not only learn the theory of their subject, but also actually get a chance to have a direct experience to see how it's implemented. The course is MAE 433, Automatic Controls. The easiest way to understand it is just to think about the uh, cruise control on your car, an automatic system that keeps your car going at a constant speed whether you're going downhill or uphill. And the second half of the course deals with a more complicated system. And what they were doing with the inverted pendulum was stabilizing an unstable system. As it starts to fall over, you then have to figure out how to respond to keep it upright. So understanding the mathematics behind it and how to model systems is really very important for control engineers. Initially, 
we were thinking about trying to send them kits, but it is actually rather difficult within a short period of time to develop a hardware in the loop controller and a motor, a rotary pendulum, all of these things to be then shipped out across the world. Over the summer prior, we worked closely with the undergraduates to try out a variety of ideas. And we learned you could use the remote control feature in Zoom. And we could have any number of students virtually controlling those benches where they can auto request remote control over that, that bench computer. The whole idea was to position the cameras in such a way that the students would feel as if they were right in front of the bench and the computer that they were working with. We settled in on a pan, tilt, and zoom arrangement where the students could then move the camera around the lab and they could actually see what was happening in the laboratory experiments at the same time that they're controlling it with the computer. When requesting help, though, and not doing the experiment themselves, I wanted them to feel that when they were being assisted by instructors, that they were actually there. There were our webcams on top of the computer monitors, and so the assistant instructors can sit in front of the bench and help the students directly and, and still be seen within the Zoom session. The students this year did not miss out on their opportunity to see what they were learning in the classroom applied directly. So that's going to have a real uh, influence on, in terms of their confidence in what they've learned. This experience uh, being remote and still controlling hardware, for companies, it might be easier to have uh, remote working uh, environments where people don't have to necessarily fly around to all of their different experiments or equipment. They've observed that it's possible to remotely operate equipment. That could have a lasting impact on what they see as possibilities. This could scale up to being a good introduction to that future. So welcome back, everyone. It's really just been such an inspirational uh, group of speakers this morning. And I, I note that all of the chat and social media is really reflecting the incredible nature of this program and, and also telling stories of other Princetonians who are doing work uh, to build their own resilience and their community's resilience. So it's just been an inspiration from beginning to end. I wonder if for the three of you, if we might start with something that, that Salika and I ended on which is thinking a little bit about building your community uh, before you need it. And I know each of you has thought a lot about going past individual resistant, uh, resilience to communal resistance. And so I wonder if you might just say a little bit, because I know in some ways this is what your lives are devoted to. Uh, and so, so Josh, would you mind kick, kicking this off? Sure. Uh, um, I really thought those points by Suleika were, were really important and poignant, especially given where we are in a pandemic, where I think we're all trying to find ways to build connection and make meaning. Um, oftentimes, um, if, if frankly, we're privileged enough to be home and isolated versus um, sort of out and, and, and moving around. At Outward Bound for us, we certainly, you know, we had to pause in-person programming as the pandemic hit. Um, and so there was almost this existential crisis of how do we support young people in our communities in building meaning and building community? And, and the way we really found that work was in to Suleika's point of, what are those communities? Who, has, who had built those communities before the pandemic and how do we sort of build or, or draw from that? Um, so I think about the Outward Bound programs in New York City that, that are actually based in schools and they do think about a crew model and they, they use student crews throughout their entire year. And so they immediately jump to this idea of can we actually use those crews of students who have built that community prior to the pandemic as, a, as sort of a hub for building meaning, building community, um, building community engagement. Um, and so what they found was, could they draw from those student groups and groups of teachers together and find out what their community needed? Because we weren't, you know, it didn't seem right to just head off into the wilderness together, but it did mean that, you know, the community in New York City certainly needed a lot of support. And so young people started finding ways to volunteer, community organizing, finding ways to, you know, what families needed what level of support at what time and was there a way that they could come together in that space? So I think for, for Outward Bound, certainly what we found was those pre-established notions of crew uh, to Suleika's point really drove 
how we started to build meaning across the country amongst the, the various outward bound communities that we see and work with. Dr. Liz, I wonder how you think about this question. Yeah, well, building community now is, is extremely important in COVID. Um, it's extremely important in gen general. So uh, the question with regards to, to parents and teens and young people, I think building community for, for teenagers at home is, is important. So how do you do that? You have to do that through connection. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of times with the disappointments that they're experiencing, it, it's hard for, for parents, for parents even to, to have that connection with their teens. So, so for me, it's, it's working on that parent teen connection first. And so that they're close enough so that uh, my goal is that when there's a challenge that comes to the, to the teenager, when the teenagers are challenged, that they feel comfortable enough and confident enough to come to their parents about that challenge mm -hmm. and ask them for their advice. And so how I do that is by three things is, is connecting. How do, you, how do parents connect? They have to learn how to listen, mm -hmm. uh, take the opportunity to embrace their teenager. How do you do that? Really telling them and making sure that they know that they're unconditionally loved no matter what. I mean, there, there are always arguments, there are always conflicts that arise, but at the end of the day, the teen needs to know no matter what they did, that they're still loved and accepted so that when something goes awry, they can come to them no matter what. And then that allows uh, the parent to help the teen launch themselves into action and make their own decisions and make their own decisions about life. Rather than lecturing them, the, the teens are able to, to uh, create a path for themselves and make the positive decisions that their parents uh, would want them to make. So creating that connection helps to then, when you create that connection, then you can build a, a community of, of like-minded people and like-minded mentors around them to give the positive reinforcement and reassure them and, and, and remind them of their strengths. And all of that goes into their reservoir, the strengths, as well as the positive inner voices of not only their parents, but their mentors, the people that they, they meet in Outward Bound, the, the, all of the, the people around them. And, and they can count on that community to support them. And, and that supports them in being and tapping into their resilience because they know that they have this network that will support them along the way, even when challenges come their way. So like, I wonder if I might ask you, because you mentioned in the chat that you just moved. Uh, and so it, when we think of, sometimes we think of community, we think of the physical space where you are, but you also said something about social media being an opportunity for creating community. And, and I think about in particular, our Princeton students right now. Mm -hmm. So you know, this for these first years, they spent the entire fall trying to build community while they weren't on the same campus. And now Princeton is bringing them back and they're having a chance to have a more, to sort of have the more normal version of community that we associate with college. But I just wonder if you might say something about how you do that. Cause I think a lot of us worry that social media is isolating. Mm -hmm. uh, and doesn't build community, it undermines community. And I wonder if you could just say a, 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 a brief uh, thought about what do you think of, of, of that question? Yeah, such a good question. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest recipes for frustration um, in this pandemic and, and one that I experienced when I was sick myself is when we try to adapt the activities or, you know, the ways of socializing and, or we try to carry those over and somehow make them fit into this new reality that we're in. Uh, because of course it's, you know, by comparison, it's going to feel underwhelming or it's going to feel endlessly disappointing. And so I think, you know, for me, part of uh, finding community when, when, you know, when the world or when our lives have been upended, it, it's reimagining it all together. Um, on this wall behind me, I have all these paintings of 
fellow young cancer patients who I met while I was in treatment, most of whom I met actually on social media, because we were all sort of sequestered in our respective hospital rooms, and we weren't well enough to hang out in person. Um, And that really became a way of finding other people who had lived similar experiences. The other thing that comes to mind is a project that my friends and family did with me uh, that was actually spearheaded by another Princeton alum, uh, Sarah Tajani, who was class of uh, 2009. Uh, But she came up with the idea of doing a 100-day project. And the concept of it was really simple, that we were each going to do a creative act every day for 100 days. and so for my dad, uh, he ended up writing a hundred childhood memories that he compiled into a little booklet and shared with us. For my mom, who's a painter, she painted a ceramic tile every day for a hundred days that she assembled into a shield and hung above my bed and told me it had protective powers. And for my hundred day project, I journaled every day. Uh, but I think, you know, finding new activities, maybe activities you wouldn't have had time for before and figuring out um not just how how to do those, but how to create uh, a structure of accountability and of of connection, of sharing around that, I think is one of the most meaningful things that we can do uh, when we're in isolation. So I want to uh, maybe ask you all. Uh, oh, please don't I jump. I just, I just love the, love those activities. No, they're so beautiful. Those are, <laughs> those are great ideas that that you know, people could do at home, you could do with your teens. So that's, uh, so that's great. So thanks for that. Yeah. I actually want to ask a question that came from a, a, my conversation with Dr. Liz, which is just thinking about this moment in time, uh, you know, and, and, and we, the pandemic, uh, a national reckoning with race, the unbelievable state of our current politics, the attack on the Capitol, it's just been a, it's been an incredibly exhausting time. And I sort of wonder where you, how you fill your own gas tanks at a moment like this, because I, I will just say one of the things that is filling my gas tank at this moment is thinking about the inspiration that you've all provided uh, for myself running an, inst- an educational institution that's watching my staff and faculty and students take care of one another and take care of their community, even as they're feeling these burdens on them. But I do. So I wonder how, you know, at this moment, how do you, do you feel optimism? Do you feel concern about our communal resilience? I'm, I'm curious sort of where you think we're going after COVID. And, and so maybe Dr. Liz, I'll start with you. Well, I, I mean, I'm optimistic uh, because I think COVID uh, has, and I think people, a lot of people have said this before, but COVID has given us all an opportunity to, to take a pause and, and reset. I mean, it, it's been an off, I mean, Hundreds of thousands of people have died. It it, it is it is uh, a, a terrible crisis that we have on hand. But again, turning an obstacle into an opportunity, and and a detour into an, a new destination, we can do this with COVID. And as long as we learn from these lessons and and don't repeat them, we learn and move forward. So the time that families have together if families use them and, and do activities or some of the activities that Salika, Salika just talked about or, or the activities in, in, in an email challenge course that I have or, or any other activities that anyone else has, it'll help shift the dynamics between not just families, but people in general, because we're connecting and I'm connecting with people that I would not normally have connected to through through uh, remotely, so uh, it's it's forming, it's help solidifying and reinforcing some connections of mine and and other people. So it, it gives me hope and optimism as long as we we take this and move forward and we don't just move backward. Josh, where, where, what you, is your view on this question? Well, I agree with Dr. Liz. I am optimistic too, and 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 recognizing the challenges that that Dr. Liz spoke to. I mean, I at Outward Bound, and and also personally, I think about the fact that, you know, for better or for worse, and and in, probably in both cases, the pandemic has sort of created a crash course in resilience for many of us or most of us. Um, and you know, whether it's those you know hundred days of activity that Suleika just spoke to, or even just being more intentional about 
you know, because I can't, you know, go to my office and stick my head over the partition and speak to a coworker, I have to think about how I'm going to build meeting and, and build community with a coworker in a digital space. And, and so I draw upon some of the work of Outward Bound as it relates to, well, what, how do we do that with students? I mean, we think about how we create belonging. We think about personal reflection and group reflection. We think about physical activity and we think about building courage. So if those aspects are the formula for our students on Outward Bound and our instructors with our students, how am I doing that personally? And, and, and I think that's where, you know, the, the pandemic has created a place where because I'm home most of the time, I would hope that I have some more time to reflect, think about that work, engage in physical activity, and perhaps even step outside of my comfort zone and find places to develop some courage. So to me, I do, I do imagine it as a way of um, this crash course in resilience and, and, and how do I become more intentional as an individual and as a coworker um, and as a leader of an organization in living the values of my organization in that way. So, so like as someone who's already had a crash course in resilience, I wonder what you're thinking about um, as this generation emerges from, from COVID, what, what should we expect? Yeah, I think, you know, these moments of, of crisis um, heighten what's already there. They heighten the good, they heighten the bad. Um, and yeah, to echo what Dr. Liz said, you know, within these obstacles, of course, we have many opportunities um, that wouldn't have been possible or that we wouldn't have had the time or, or the need to stumble across. And I think the kind of resilience we can build in isolation, if we choose to exercise that muscle is something that's going to far outlast uh, the COVID pandemic. So one thing I'm so struck by all of you is how you systematically thought about how to break down the process of building resilience, Dr. Liz's, you know, 21 day program, your 100 days, you know, each one of you has a strategy for it. And we only have a, a minute or two left, but in closing, I wonder if you were just talking to a student on campus right now, dealing with everything that they're dealing with, if you had one or two sentences to tell them what they should do today, just one thing to do today, uh, what, what would you suggest? Maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Liz. Uh, so one thing to do today, I would say, um, give yourself a break. And when I say that, I don't mean, you know, just rest, but give yourself a break, give your spell, give yourself permission to, to, to feel, I mean, they've gone through so much. So just, just take an emotional break, uh, take a physical break and go easy on yourself. And um, that's what I would say. Josh, what about you? What would you tell people to do? I, well, I think there's going to be a theme here, perhaps. But I, 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 too, would say, how do you, I would ask them, have you made space for personal reflection and the opportunity to perhaps exist in your metacognitive space? So rather than just sort of moving from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, which I remember at Princeton, I mean, it's a grind and it's tough and you're trying to achieve and do all the things that you need to do. Um, but I do think there needs to be that space for reflection and to think about your own thinking and thinking about your own experience. Um, and on the one hand, that's a sort of a privileged opportunity when you can make that space. But I think now more than ever, we need to create that space for one another and for ourselves. So like, I wonder if you might, might close us out. Yeah, I'll just build off of what Josh was saying. Um, you know, prior to the pandemic, I think we all were living in this culture of busyness and um, we have a reprieve from that um, or the possibility of it. And I think uh, to Josh's point, that's an opportunity for reflection. I'd encourage people to journal. I know to some people, it sounds like a juvenile activity that yeah, belongs in elementary school with your diary and its little lock. Um, but I, yeah, my journaling practice, I wake up, it's the first thing I do. Um, and I write three pages by hand. Um, and and that, that daily act of, of reflection and excavation, I think has been one of the most valuable ones. And if you want to start a hundred day project uh, with your fellow students, with your friends, with your community. Well, I know I speak on behalf of everyone who has been watching this program. I just want to say thank you for giving us a break and a moment for reflection and being a source of inspiration and wisdom to all of us. You really embody the very best of this university. And I just wanna say thank you so much for spending time with us today. Well, th 
Thank you for having me. It was great to be here. Yeah, thank you. Likewise, it's great to be in this community. Thank you. Uh, it's been an honor. Take care, everyone. And, and thanks, thanks to all the Princeton staff who helped us put this together. Thank you for engaging in this Forward Fest. Be sure to keep the conversation going on social media with hashtag Princeton Forward and visit forwardthinking.princeton.edu to access more forward thinking content, including a downloadable resource guide for this month's Forward Fest that will help you dive deeper into these ideas. At noon Eastern Standard, we'll resume the Forward Fest live sessions with alumni forward thinkers on exploration. But first, we've prepared a special look back at select moments in our previous Forward Fest where faculty forward thinkers came together to discuss such topics as public health, criminal justice, artificial intelligence, the humanities, and equity in education. Enjoy. This year has tested us. As a nation and a university. Yet, we've faced adversity many times throughout our long history. And we're no stranger to challenge. We know that complexity is challenging, but for us, it's inspiration to move forward. Forward in the pursuit of fundamental knowledge and practical solutions with a sense of service and a quest for equity and excellence. Forward in rethinking our future. Thinking forward, science, democracy, creative expression, data, inclusion, justice, the environment. Thinking together we can do this. Together, let's take the next step. Let this be a year of discovery, a year of possibilities, a year of forward thinking. Welcome to one of the hallmark events of a year of forward thinking, Forward Fest. I'm Mary Newbern, Vice President of the Alumni Association of Princeton University, Vice Chair of the Alumni Council, and a member of the great class of 1997. Although we may not be gathering in person this year, our virtual Forward Fests continue to offer the chance to engage with bold ideas, varied approaches, and forward thinking that